Welcome to Caravan. This is Will Sanchez. My very special guest tonight is Rob Vasilarakis, also known as simply Rob. Rob is one of the representatives of the Foot Locker Five Borough representing the Bronx. Wow, wait till you hear his story. Please welcome Rob, or simply Rob, to the show. I will. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. Rob, let's get started by sharing with our audience just a little bit about the background. Where were you born? Something about the family? Something about the schooling? I'm a born and raised New Yorker. Uh, my mother's from El Salvador. My father is Greek, hence Vasilorakis. I was raised in Great Neck, Long Island um, by my single mother. My father was never really in the picture. I'm an only child. I went to school in Great Neck. I went to Great Neck North Junior High School and then went to Great Neck South Senior High School. When I was about 13, there was a speech therapist that lived in my building mm -hmm. that worked in the Great Neck Public School System. And she used to run three miles in the afternoon after work. Mm -hmm. So I used to join her on those jogs. In high school, the track coach tried to recruit me for the track team. Uh -huh. And I went to a couple of practices but it was really intense, so I couldn't, I couldn't hang in there. I felt like all the other boys were much faster than me, and I f had a really hard time keeping up with them. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I went to two practices, and then I dropped out. Is there any point in time that was instrumental in your life that you made a change in course? When I was 17, my mother read a journal and found out I was gay, and she threw me out of the house. And you had your personal journal? Yes, the personal journal that I would write in. <laughs> Initially, I lied and I told her that I was writing a character, a fictitious character, and that I was, you know, putting together a storyline mm -hmm. by way of journal entries. And she, she wanted to believe it at first, but, you know, after a while, it just it became a little harder to, to keep from her. Mm -hmm. And once confronted, I told her the truth and I was asked to change or leave and being that I couldn't change, I had to leave. Mm -hmm. So I was a young gay man in New York City. 17 years old. 17. Going still on going 18. to high school? I had just graduated high school. Yeah, absolutely. That altered the course of my life. Wow. So you know? what did you do at that tender age? Oh, Youth Enrichment Services and Glenny, Gay and Lesbian Youth of New York. And I had made two friends there that were going in on a sublet in the Lower East Side. They had enough for the first month's rent, but not enough for the security. Mm -hmm. And being that I had worked all through high school, I had saved up, you know, a little a little money, so I paid for the security. And, okay. But, you know, I didn't have much more than that, so none of us were working. So, you know, it, was, it wasn't but a month or two before we were all on the street again. Out on our ears. <laughs> oh my gosh, so yeah. you were hustling the streets? I mean, you were going, going to college or school and you needed to make money. I had odd jobs. You know, I, I, worked, at re I worked retail jobs. I worked in the club scene. Uh, so I had an array of different jobs, but it was difficult holding any of them down. I was young and flaky and, mm -hmm. you know, a free agent, free young and free in New York City, my playground of New York City. Now, at some point you got involved into drugs. How yes. did that happen? In 1993, I was dating a man who um, who's HIV positive, I, unbeknownst to me, we had never had that conversation. He introduced me to crystal meth. That winter, before I tested positive, he tried to tell me that he was positive, but he just couldn't find the words. He kept, you know, fumbling, like, mm -hmm. I, I have something, I, I, I don't know how to tell you, and in my gut, I knew. But he introduced me to crystal meth, and with with the crystal meth lifestyle, it comes with a, a heavy-duty party, a lot of drugs and a lot of sex, that, that kind of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I fell into that. I absolutely fell into that. Um, At this point, your mom was completely out of the picture. She just totally, totally, totally. gave I, up on you. She didn't totally give up on me. It, I think it was pretty much a mutual decision. My mother fell. My mother became a, a, a Pentecostal after she threw me out of the house. And mm -hmm. so the few times that I tried to reach out to her, she was very adamant about trying to get me into the church and <laughs> convinced that I was possessed by demons okay. and that I needed to find Jesus and that he would cure me of this demons. 
that that I was possessed by. And so I felt on some level that my mom was coming from a good place and wanted the best for me, but mm -hmm. that she wasn't really dealing with reality. Okay. I knew that when it came to guidance and support that, you know, my family, my mother was not someone I could necessarily turn to. Mm -hmm. So I turned to other people and not everybody had their my best interest at heart. Okay. You know? The summer of ninety three, just shy of my twenty third birthday, I came down with a with with a flu. I got tested. Uh, I tested positive for HIV. Mm -hmm. How did you take that news? It must have been devastating. You know, it was difficult, but like in my gut, I knew one. I knew what I had been doing. Mm -hmm. At that time, the information we had in 1993 was that we had about seven years, okay. right, before people got sick and potentially okay. died. Okay. So that's what I was told. I said, "Oh no, you you still have a, a good seven years left," <laughs> right, and. Um, and so in my head, the number was 2001. I didn't think okay. I, would, I would see the year, to, okay. you know, to live out the year of 2001. I th figured I would reclaim my life. I was going to live each day as if it were my last. And okay. that's when I started to get into health and fitness. I bought a bike. I wanted to raise awareness. Uh, I signed up for the Boston New York AIDS ride. I realized that the people in my community um, I think I had a lot invested in the attention that I was getting. I wanted to be loved. Mm -hmm. And uh, oftentimes uh, what I experienced as, you know, uh, maybe people interested in me for, for reasons other than, you know, just wanting to be a friend or looking mm -hmm. out for my best interest, mm -hmm. you know, um, there may have been ulterior motives. I, I accepted that because it was, in, in my experience, it was a form of love, okay. right? And I noticed that those same people that were so invested really seemed to be scared of the fact that I was HIV positive and I, I was rejected a lot because of my status. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it kicked up a lot of my stuff because I had already dealt with all of this rejection, mm -hmm. right? Which started to wear on me and, you know, um, although I was out and proud of being gay, I still had suffered with internalized homophobia. Somebody turned me on to Harlem United, enrolled in the day program in October, um, April of 07. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was able to, you know, in my recovery, um, be honest and, and I felt safe in, a, in an environment with other people like myself who were also struggling, a lot of them struggling with substance abuse issues also HIV positive, you know, sexuality issues. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was able to, you know, discuss these issues in a group and I feel safe. I was a client of the El Faro Day Program, the Adult Day Healthcare Service okay. uh, Center, which offers medical care, uh, uh, HIV support groups, substance abuse groups, there's art therapy classes, there's a gym on site, uh -huh. you know, and so I was able to stay on top of my health you know, check in with the doctor once a month, have my bloods drawn every three months, and still work on my recovery and, and support. And they actually helped me get housed and, you know, and become stable. In 09, um, I, once stable in, in my apartment and, um, you know, out of the rehab, um, I decided that I needed to reach out to those friends that I had alienated during those years where I was getting high, especially mm -hmm. towards the end, it was very severe. And mm -hmm. one of those friends is my dear friend, Joanne Pate, okay. who is, a, if I'm not mistaken, she's a five or six time marathon runner. Wow. I had received the email several times before asking, you know, some of her friends if we would come and support her um, along the route. Or be and, crew, like uh, supplies yeah, and stuff, and cheering, that's important. Right, right. I said, yes, I will be there. I will go 2009, to the Bronx. This is, this is 2009. So I was leaving my house, and I get a phone call from Joanne um, asking me, she said, are you, are you coming? Are you coming to see me? And I was like, well, yeah, Joanne, I'm, I'm on my way, but what are you doing calling me? And she says, aren't you supposed to be running? She says, I am running. I'm in the Bronx, but I have the flu, so I need cough drops. I need gum. Oh, heck, bring me both. <laughs> so with, uh, with uh, gum and cough drops in tow, I took the 5 train to 138th Street. And um, as soon as I, I came up the stairs, I, I love telling the story because this was the moment that I knew I had to participate in this. 
Um, I came up the stairs from the five train, and it's right along the marathon route, just, you know, as we're about to take the bridge back into Manhattan. And I was, I was hit with this wall of energy that I, I can't describe. Mm -hmm. um, it's indescribable. I just know that I was completely wrapped up and consumed in it. And mm -hmm. as I was walking along the route to make it to the spectator point, Everyone just looked so beautiful to me. They were glowing. Mm -hmm. And I later found out that this was mile 1920. Wow, right? wow. And, um, That's a tough and, part of the course. Absolutely. But they still look good to they you. Look I was clapping and telling everybody, you look beautiful, you look beautiful. And somebody shouted back, oh, yeah, you should see me after a shower. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but to me, they looked, they, what, what, what they were giving off is I not only wanted to feel that again, but I had to become part of the source generating mm -hmm. that. That night I was on the phone, I said, listen, you know, I know you're really tired, I know you need to rest up, but when do we start running? <laughs> and so I was on her for three weeks and it was late November of that year that she took me on my first three mile run. From that point I started doing what I like to call my little five mile loop that I mapped out on Map My Run. I kept hounding Joanne and so around December, January, I started running with her and team members from Van Cortlandt Track Club in the Bronx. We would do little runs from Riverdale to, down the Greenway along the Hudson. Okay, that's a which beautiful was, run. I, it's my favorite run in the city. Okay. I, I've run all over the city and I was in my drug phase. I did a lot of wandering around, especially when I was homeless, and I, I realized I really have taken back my life. I really have taken back these streets, these neighborhoods, this, my city, the city where I was born and raised. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's no longer just drug references there. Now there's life being the source of this energy now that I give off. You're going to be doing the New York City Marathon again this year. As the you Foot Locker Five Borough Challenge representative for the Bronx. How did you learn about it? How did you get selected? The charity I run for is Harlem United. Giddy Chang, who is uh, one of the employees of Harlem United, I think she's in PR and, uh, and other things. She came knocking on my office door and she said, did you send it? I, I was like, oh no, I didn't have a chance to. Okay. She's like, we're doing it right now. She pulled me out of my chair, sat down on my computer, and before I knew it, it had been submitted and I had, I had forgotten all about it. Get a call from Gabriella from Foot Locker doing an initial phone interview to follow up the, you know, the, right. uh, the application, the online application. Right. And, I'm answering, cause she's, I know she's asking me questions and I know I'm answering them, but I also know I'm multitasking and my office phone is, is ringing and, and someone's knocking on my door and I have no idea what I said. Like the, the call came and went and it wasn't until I got the email, I think it was an email, I can't remember if it was an email or a phone call saying that they wanted to meet me for the face-to-face -face interview that I realized, oh my God, like this is really, ha this is happening, this is, wait a minute. I, what, what did I get myself into here? What does this mean? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I wasn't even really sure, but I think part of the criteria was that you needed to be able to run the marathon in about four hours. My time from last year was 4.57 okay. and change. Okay. So when I, I knew that I could do better than that time. Okay. okay. Right? Running is a very social thing. Right. Times. So for me, it was really about getting through and I wanted to savor every moment of it. Right. So it wasn't about just, you know, right. the time. and Your first you time you really wanted to savor because of the crowd support. Absolutely, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I, I tell people now, if you want to know what it's like to be superstar, Madonna, Lady Gaga, famous, run a marathon and put your name on your shirt. And in New York City. In New York City. So you are a hero for that day. And Absolutely. you are a hero. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was asked to come in for the face-to-face -face interview. I knew, I, I think I may have even said it at the interview, I, you know, not from a cocky place at all. It was just an intuition. I had, you know, on my training runs, um, I was running with some of my Van Cortland um, track club team members, and I told them what was happening. and. Um, Alexandra, for example, was like, of course, that makes so much sense. Like, this, is, I, and she was like, I had heard the announcement on the radio and I thought, wow, that's gonna be really hard criteria to, to find somebody for, but now that you're telling me this, this is yours, man. Like, this is, they'd be, they'd have to be crazy not to pick you. And I, you know, I was really humbled by that. Mm -hmm. And I, I really, you know, appreciated the support and I felt like she was trying to encourage me. I walked in and I, I had the interview and I just, 
I think I even said, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity, but I, this feels like it's mine, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? And then, sure enough, I got the phone call afterwards, started screaming, <laughs> oh my God, oh my God! Like, I felt like I had just won a million dollars on the radio, you know, when they call you from the radio and they're like, you know, you have won. The lottery. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God! Because everybody's asking, what's the commotion about? Yeah, yeah, exactly, everyone was looking at me like, Okay, Rob, what's wrong with he's not, not simply Rob, he's simply crazy. Gabriella even said, oh my God, I love that response. <laughs> and it does make sense because I feel like, you know, all of the attention I've gotten from it on a personal level, I think really has validated everything I've been through. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not that I need anyone to tell me that I've been some, through some stuff, but the acknowledgement, it's, you know, I really have. And I really have overcome you have. some things. Two or three examples of when I could have, should have died, you know? And without going into too much detail, one time was the first time I shot up crystal meth. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt it go up my left arm. And when it hit my heart, it was like, <laughs> like someone had kicked me in my chest and wow. I had, the wind had knocked out of me and I, I remember thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. And I thought, okay, well, if, if this is it, this is it. And I literally leaned back in my chair expecting to die. Mm -hmm. Another time was I had made the wrong choices. I um, agreed to hang out with some somebody thinking it was gonna be one thing, but in all actuality, they were trying to rob me. And so I ended up in a car in a dark street at night with a gun at my throat. Oh my gosh. I had a Metro card and like $12 in my pocket. I had this gun at my throat and I couldn't swallow because it was uh, up against my Adam's apple. Somehow there was this serenity that came over me and I was really calm, I didn't freak out. And I said, uh, you don't want to kill me and I don't want to die. Hmm. And he was like, are you done? Like yelling, like really, like he thought I was now that, you know, somehow I was playing him. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I didn't even know it all. I started to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Out loud. Yes. I didn't even know the whole prayer. I, I think I said, as uh, thy kingdom come, and he was like, get out of my car! <laughs> and he, you know, he flung the door open and he told me to get out of the car. And it wasn't until he drove away that the rush hit me like, wow, oh my God, I, I could have died. Yeah, you yeah. know. So I know. I know that all of that to say that this has given me an opportunity. This is bigger than me. Okay. You know, this has given me an opportunity to shout out Harlem United, to shout out Joanne and Van Cortland, the people that have supported me um, in, as a runner, as a person, the people that have believed in me, El Grito de Poetas, which is my, what my, uh, my poetry collective. I'm one of seven members, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the family that God has brought to me. All of that was meant to happen because mm -hmm. I, I have a story to tell. I'm being used by the God of my understanding to tell this story so that someone else can be freed, so that somebody else can be freed of, of the suffering and the substance abuse. And I, I speak for, for that young gay, lesbian, or transgender child that mm -hmm. is, is sick and suffering mm -hmm. because they're afraid to come out because they'll be ridiculed or 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 for the person who is so consumed by guilt and shame and mm -hmm. and and self-loathing that the only way conceivable to numb that pain is through drugs you're a tremendous spokesperson but you mentioned uh, poetry so mm -hmm. you do poetry yes so so let's uh, take a break and, uh, and have you perform some poetry. But in the meantime, I want to wish you success this coming marathon in a couple Thank of you. weeks. You'll be running, I presume, with your four other comrades, the other boroughs the together? The first 13.1 miles we will be running together. I really look forward to that. It's gonna be great. They're, they're also wonderful. They're great people. Well, you guys will be running together for 13.1. And after that? After that, it's a race own. within a race, and we'll, we'll be running toward the thousand dollars towards our charity and that Tiffany trophy. Thank you so much. Thank and you so much for the opportunity. And now we're gonna take a break. Okay. And we'll set up and uh, do some performance. Okay. I'll start with uh, 
mortality and legacy. I used to have my whole life ahead of me. Now at best, my glass is half full and I still thirst. I thirst in the desert of what I have to show for myself for the moisture of a purpose yet to be discovered. All I can do is spit. I spit to unchapped lips dehydrated because for an addicted, HIV positive homo of color in America, there are already too many reasons to feel worthless. I fall back and observe this, judging you, judging me, allowing myself to be taken to the places comparisons can lead. Depression is anger turned inward, so I write myself inside out. I write because it's easier to express than it is to feel. I spit about my pain so someone else can hold it for a while. You see, they mess with me, the moments spent dwelling on my past, but I can't help it. I look back on a life full of uncertainty and lowered expectations, thought out and impulsive choices. I swim in the ocean of my memories. I drown in the indigo of my pain. I am resuscitated by my refusal to die without creating a legacy to leave behind as my virus and I walk hand in hand toward the dawn of our sunset years together. I wring my gut out in these poems. I wear my heart on lines refrained. I beat back my demons trying to keep them tame because I no longer get high to escape my pain. Writing is all I have to keep me sane as the thoughts in my brain grind against each other louder than any subway train. The only way to lower the volume is by allowing them to speak through the ink. I'm not really crazy about the stuff I've been writing these days, so I stab my soul with a pen. I puncture through spiritual dimensions, rolling my ballpoint against the surface of lives past. Scratching them, I dig a little deeper in hopes that what bleeds will leave a profound sense of connection for the ones who listen or who read. More than just tales of intrigue, I drop jewels while claiming my place amongst those witches, word players, and speakers of truth that have come before me planting seeds of poet trees, bearing fruits of inspiration for the ones who will secede. My poetry is my legacy. I call this my redemption poem. Teeming is the hustle and the bustle above and underground as from the boogie down, I make my way downtown. Upon my descent to the D train, I pass two dudes exchanging a pound. Suddenly my feet keep a beat as I'm momentarily all consumed by the sounds of the congas as three brothers with their fingers and their palms pound against the skins. Despite my current set of circumstances, a sensation, an almost elation takes hold and suddenly I realize that God works in mysterious ways. On the platform I hear a mother preach the gospel to her kids, her way the way life raising four on her own has taught her. You don't have to go to no church or be an altar boy to talk to God, she says. That just leaves you open to be molested by some priest. In one fell swoop, the silver snake scoops me up and as the doors close, it dawns on me that I can feel again. I can begin to heal again. I can be a friend to myself. The self I'd left collecting dust atop a shelf in some old and moldy closet. With my mouth like cotton, I thirst to write down the words that burn and blaze as the eyes of the person sitting next to me on the subway move widely from side to side on my page. Eyes that bear witness to my release by way of the pen of the fear and rage that for some time have been my cage. And so I sit, and so I write, and with the writer's block unstopped and with my tongue no longer tied in knots, the paper and pen are once again my friends. Or was it I who had turned my back on them? New York City. The clouds that color the day and the horizon in hues of gray sometimes hover above the city where taxi cabs zoom, skyscrapers rascan el cielo, and the beat of many drums boom. New York City. That's what's up, that's what's up, town that'll scoop you up or slam dunk you down. It'll make your spirit sing or make your heart wear a frown. 
During the rush hour madness, a crowd gathers round, drawn by the sounds rhythmic and profound that rebound off of buckets in a conga drum, buckets in a conga drum. The beats that are felt and not just heard stem from the ancestors' days as some young bucks play their hearts away, trying to make some bills this way. Playing the conga, the dude's a dime, shaking his head, makes his dreads beat his face in time. I feel fine as emotions that intoxicate like a potion spread over me like skin lotion. And people of all persuasions, young, old, gay, straight, black, white, Latino, and Asian, become the United Nations in Penn Station, unable to keep ourselves from moving to the beat of the drums, moving to the beat of the drums. New York City's where I come from. Where a ball and a wall are all you need to have fun. Where some have plenty, yet many have none. And late at night, the subways are overrun by rats the size of cats and the homeless. Where everything changes too fast to keep score. Where somehow, some way, a window stays open despite all the locked doors. And where the woman that's known by most as a whore struggles to feed a habit and a family of four. Where a young thug, trying to act grown, trying to hold his own, brags to his homies about how he made the girl moan. Yeah, no doubt, son. And I took pictures with my cell phone. Yo, I'll let you peep that for a bust down off of that bone. New York City's the only city where hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. Becomes the pace, the place, the pace, the place, the pulse in my veins. Where Times Square blazes like a fire too wild to tame. Where I took my first breath and still play the game of chasing paper and sometimes fame. From time to time wondering if I dream in vain, but I still dare to dream. Wanting to be heard and not just seen for the spotlight like a crack pipe I fiend. In adulation I am redeemed, but when the applause stops, I'm left back from where I came. I'm chasing paper and sometimes fame. So I'm running against time and I'm fighting against the grind and I'm trying to find that thing to make my mark with, to leave behind. Some semblance of me to be retrieved when all that's left of me is a grave, forgotten, overrun by weeds. So I plant my seeds and I remind myself to <gasps> breathe. And I thank all gods for New York City, the city on which all my hungers feed. Peace. Thank you. Gotta run. 